Hey guys, Sophie Line here, and we're back at the National Armor and Cavalry Collection. I have Rob Kogan, he's the curator here, as well as the famous Tiger 712, and Mr. Kogan is going to talk a little bit about that, as well as the restoration efforts and a bit of the future of the facility here. So I'm going to turn the camera over to Rob. All right, so if you're new following Sophie here and you don't know the background of Tiger 712, I'll give you a brief synopsis, as brief as I can make it. Uh, so Tiger 712 is serial number 31 of 1,370 Tiger 1 tanks made by the Germans in World War II. Uh, that makes it the oldest Tiger 1 left in existence, and it has some features you're not going to find in other Tiger 1s, being what they call an initial production Tiger 1. We know that it eventually, under a different tactical number, went to North Africa, fought there against uh, both British Commonwealth forces, Commonwealth, uh, a lot more people than just the British there, Commonwealth, uh, as well as some American forces we believe at the very end of its career, uh, under different tactical numbers. It wasn't 712 originally, it changed tactical numbers multiple times. We do know at one point it was 812, then converted to 712. Uh, and it served there, and then in May, early May, late April 1943, as German forces surrender, uh, it was recovered by the Allies. There's still some, some unfortunately, gaps in research exactly how that occurred, but we do know that it appeared in a palm grove with some other destroyed tigers, uh, probably the last operational tiger left in North Africa. Uh, eventually secured by the 2nd American Corps, brought back to the United States for testing and evaluation by the Ordnance Corps, and uh, really kind of becomes the first major German piece captured by the U.S. Army in World War II. So uh, quite, quite a... Uh, famous piece then as far as just that that field of captured enemy vehicles. Um, after going through test evaluation at Aberdeen Proving Ground and then spent a little bit of time in Washington DC where it's put on display for the American public and then uh, 1945, 1946 time period the US Army just starts getting rid of all its captured German equipment. Uh, at one point we know there was at least a couple Tigers, a couple Tiger twos, and we think at least 14 Panther tanks in the US Army's inventory which is quite a large amount and they just started sending them out as either range targets or scrapping them. Uh, obviously, today we would be horrified by that because now we look at them as historical objects. Back then, that wasn't the case. You gotta understand, a lot of these people, this is the generation that grew up in the Great Depression. If you couldn't use it right there now and then for some important purpose, scrap it, turn to something else. And so they didn't look at this as a historic object. Uh, but luckily for us, the colonel that recovered it in North Africa, who was then in charge of the entire Ordnance Corps foreign material collection, uh, he gets this idea, I can use these German vehicles as teaching pieces for teaching U.S. soldiers. And so if you come around here to the side, and this is the part where people will gasp, uh, I will get dirty messages claiming that I'm the one that cut it open. In uh, 1946, several of our German pieces were turned to cutaways. And the whole point is if you went to Colonel George Jarrett's instruction building at Aberdeen Proving Grounds in the late 40s, you would have these completely outfitted uh, with equipment inside, and sometimes you'd even have soldiers inside showing the crew battle drills, showing the ergonomics of the vehicle. And to him, that was important for not just soldiers to see, but also for tank designers to see. You know, how did the Germans design the vehicles? What were strengths? What were weaknesses? Um, today, to this day, that's what we use this vehicle for. Um, Tiger 712 did that for several more years, uh, and then unfortunately was put outside of Aberdeen Premier Grounds, where it unfortunately deteriorated. I think it was the mid-1980s, it was sent on loan to Europe. So that's the first time it was really brought in from outside. So about 40 years outside. Uh, got a little little care and, and, and some minor cosmetic work uh, while I was in Europe. Um, but then in 2012, it finally returned to the United States. And this is really the first time it was taken down to as bare as possible. Um, so the reason why I bring this up is because much like uh, the entire collection, uh, Tiger 712, while it looks really nice right now, we've only just gotten started. So really what we've done the last couple years is just cleaning this vehicle, taking components apart, um, stripping off areas that had, you know, the, in some cases, I think we kind of like eight or nine layers of paint from over the years I put on the vehicle. Um, and we started learning things from parts numbers. Um, you know, case in point, we know at some point this fender here was completely replaced. You can see it's a whole different fender. It's actually still numbered. Uh, to 028, whereas all the other fenders are serial number to 031, so that was probably uh, a part taken off another vehicle at some point. Uh, and started learning more about this vehicle. The big thing we learned as we were taking parts is the color scheme. We always assumed that this had a similar color scheme to the British Tiger, Tiger 131, uh, at Bovington. Uh, we were able to confirm that because we actually found this raw 8000 color inside the area underneath the final drives. And that was just amazing to find that 
uh, because we had proof. It wasn't just hearsay, it was just something we read in a book to say, no, we confirm, we have set, found that actual paint sample. Uh, and so that was one of the things we spent a lot of time on, uh, was just researching the paint colors. And then finally about six months ago, uh, we had to make the decision, what were we going to do with this tank before we moved over here to our new building? So some of you that follow know, uh, we only got this building last year. We started moving vehicles into it and we were reaching the point where uh, our new restoration shop just across the alley from the new building we're in right now, that's just now getting finished. And so soon we're gonna be working out of that building. So the old restoration shop, we have to get ready to close down. Uh, so we kind of reached a point where we said, okay, we're gonna get the vehicle in a base coat. We're gonna get the tracks back on. We're not gonna touch the interior yet. We still have all the interior components uh, stored away, the transmission, the engine, uh, the tour basket, everything else. They're all still created up from, from when they returned from Europe. Uh, so we decided let's get in a base coat of paint, get the tracks on so we can get it moved and bring it over here so it's at least just presentable. And then once everything's situated, we'll go ahead, we'll get, get it moved over to the rest new restoration shop. Uh, and you'll notice, that where it's at here in the building, there's actually a roll-up door right behind it. And so the whole point is, as we work on this vehicle, we can move back and forth between phases. So we don't wanna, we don't wanna hide the Tiger away for several more years, uh, but in between phases of, of getting more parts restored, uh, be able to show it off. Uh, 712, we go ahead, we spent six months researching paint colors. I will tell you, I don't think I've ever researched just one detail uh, that much in my life. But I was just going back and forth. I looked at so many paint samples from different companies. And finally, thankfully for us, we found here in the United States a company that actually uh, does paint to the German Rawl standard. We had to get that tweaked a little bit because the Rawl colors from 1942, 43 time period aren't necessarily the same as today. But we did some tweaking. You'll notice it's a little bit on the semi-gloss side with that because it, it tends to form a harder shell, which is great when we're moving the vehicle around, doesn't get so scratched up. And it's gonna make it easier to clean, keep dust off, and. That may seem like it's a cosmetic uh, choice, but in reality, it actually means the paint's gonna last a lot longer. Because if you have to clean the paint on a tank a lot because of dust, you start removing the paint after a while. Uh, it's still curing, believe it or not. As I'm standing here, I can actually still smell the fumes from the paint coming off. Uh, so yeah. this is gonna look great. You'll notice so it's just the Raw 8000 base coat. Uh, Tiger 712, like Tiger 131, uh, would have had a two color scheme, camouflage pattern known as uh, Tropin 1. Uh, tropical scheme. Uh, so it would have had a one-third coating then of, of, of seven, eight, uh, 7008 Rowell color, uh, which is like a khaki grayish, slightly green color. And we do have the paint for that already, uh, but we're going to do some other work and then we'll pull the vehicle out. We're not only going to paint that camouflage scheme on, uh, we're going to look at getting the original tactical numbers. And by original, the number she was found with, because like I said, we think at least three or four times it changed tactical numbers. And then uh, we will also then on the front of the vehicle, we will paint the battalion insignia that it would have had for the 501st uh, heavy tank battalion of the German army. Um, so much like us in this building, we've moved 170 pieces into the building so far. There's about another 37 outside now. So we already have 200 pieces moved over here. Uh, it's been an amazing year for that. Uh, again though, much like the Tiger, we're just getting started. And so, our entire efforts this last year, just get the vehicles in here, and then uh, we began the, the very wild ride of, I'm just looking out at the vehicles now, uh, of starting to pull and rotate vehicles through uh, for repainting, for restoration, um, for you know, working on engines and other components, uh, and I'm really looking forward to it. As far as the tire, one of the big things we often get asked, are we gonna fix up the holes that were put into the vehicle? Um, first and foremost, I am sad this happened, all right? Uh, and the reason why I say it is because usually, like I said, every time something on social media shows the tiger, especially its cutaways, I get horrible, nasty messages that I'm a horrible person and I let this happen. Look, folks, in 1946, I wasn't born yet. My father wasn't born yet. Uh, none of my family was involved with this. Uh, so please don't blame me. Um, I'm just laughing because some of the messages have been quite, quite hilarious. Uh, calling for my resignation and firing and all sorts of great things when I wasn't born. Uh, but I often get asked, you know, are we going to plug this up? Right now, no. For what we use this collection for, which is teaching not just soldiers in the military, but civilians in the military as well, research and developers, uh, people in the tech world, uh, this is fantastic. And I will tell you, every time I give a tour through this building, we go over 100 plus years of armored fighting vehicles from prior to 1916 to today. And at the end of it all, I usually give about 10 to 15 minutes to one around their own, if not more. And this is the vehicle people always just come up to and they just stand here and they just gaze in. 
and you can kind of see their minds are just trying to comprehend everything they learn. And this is the vehicle they always gravitate towards. Uh, so in that respect, much like Colonel Jared did in 1946, I understand uh, the value of this. Um, I wish it hadn't happened. I would love to have, you know, fully complete Tiger I. Um, but there is some, I have to admit, there is some value to it. And so uh, for right now, we're going to keep the cutaways. My hope is to make the interior as complete as possible. Uh, have as much stuff inside as, as we can, show, you know, mannequins showing the crew in there, uh, eventually start putting some of the ammunition in the rack so they're all filled, and give you appreciation, appreciation that while this vehicle may look very large, the room inside for the crew, really, uh, you're looking at maybe not even a quarter of the space in here is just for the crew to operate. Everything else has, has, a, has something that goes into it or a purpose. Uh, and so, I look forward to continuing work on this vehicle, but on the on the Tiger. But I look forward to working on all the pieces in the collection. Uh, I think we are entering a, uh, a really good period of time, and I look forward to making it happen. Many thanks to Rob for uh, his time and as well to the access. It was really an interesting experience to be able to film the moving footage and I hope you enjoyed that as well. To keep up with their progress, as he mentioned, the best way to do that is actually over on their social media. There's a really, really, really active update going on of the different progress of vehicles being moved in, exhibits being added, macro and micro artifacts that are moved around, changed, and placed for display. So follow the links down below in the description. If you liked the video, like and subscribe here for more videos from the National Armored Cavalry Collection and more armored adventures, and I'll see you next time.